morning. This is Leah Tate, and it's my pleasure to welcome everyone to the second day of the February 2022 meeting of the California Board of Psychology. I would like to call the meeting to order and ask that Ms. Preteau please call the roll to establish quorum. Good morning. Uh, Kasuga. Here. Cervantes. Here. Fu. Here. Harb Sheets. Here. Nystrom. Here. Phillips. Here. Riscate. Here. Rogers. Here. Tate. Here. Roll is complete. Perfect. Quorum has been established. The board will be meeting in closed session pursuant to government code section 1126 C3 to discuss disciplinary matters, including petitions, proposed decisions, stipulations, and petitions for reconsideration and remands. Um, I'm, I'm estimating we'll be in closed session for 30 to 45 minutes, just for the public to know. Thank you. So we'll begin closed session now. Thank you so much. Welcome back. The Board of Psychology is going to take on agenda item 13. But before we begin, I would like Ms. Proto to call the roll just to make sure everyone is back. Sure. Kasuga? Here. Cervantes? Here. Boo? Hi. Arb Sheets? Here. Nystrom? Here. Phillips? Here. Riscate? Here. Rogers? Here. Tate? Here. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. Everyone is here. Quorum is established. We'll be going on to public comment for items not on the agenda. The board may not discuss or take action on any matter raised during this public comment section, except to decide whether to place the matter on the agenda of a future meeting. And before I invite speakers to come forward for public comment, I'd ask individuals making comments to not discuss the specifics, including names as to pending complaints, pending licensee applications, or pending disciplinary actions that may come before the board for a decision. Such discussions are considered ex parte communications as it could provide information to the members that is outside of the record in violation of the Administrative Procedure Act. While there may be a desire to engage in further discussion with comments presented during this time, the board may not discuss or take action on any matter raised during this public comment section, except to decide whether to place the matter on the agenda of a future meeting. This may give the impression that we are not being responsive. These procedures are critical to ensure the compliance with the Open Meetings Act and to avoid compromising the speaker's goals or the board's mission. And with that, Ms. Moderator, can you please open public comment? This is the moderator and at the direction of the board, I have opened up the Q&A feature for public comment. Members of the public, if you would like to make a comment for items not on the agenda, please click that icon with a question mark within a square located at the bottom right hand corner of your WebEx screen. I'll go ahead and pause a moment to allow uh, participants the time to uh, indicate that they would like to make a public comment. And additionally, if you are an audio only participant, um, you can indicate that you would like to make a comment by clicking star three on your device to raise your hand. All right, this is the moderator. Uh, seeing no requests for comment, would you like me to close that Q&A panel? Yes, thank you very much. Uh, agenda items 14, 15, 16, and 18 were completed during the board meeting yesterday. So we will go on to agenda item number 17, which is the Department of Consumer Affairs update. Is Brianna Miller on the line? Yes, good morning, how are you? Good, I'll give you the floor. Thank you. All right, good morning board members. I'm Brianna Miller with the Department of Consumer Affairs as Board and Bureau Relations. Thank you for allowing me an opportunity to provide a department update to your board today. I'd like to first start with an update on COVID-19 safety measures. 
DCA appreciates all board members and staff who have continued to serve through a pandemic that has affected all of us in so many ways. As California moves past the recent Omicron surge and into a new endemic reality, a new state public health order lifted universal masking for vaccinated individuals beginning February 16th. Unvaccinated individuals must still wear face coverings in all indoor settings and in some high risk settings, such as healthcare facilities, face coverings will still be required for everyone, regardless of vaccination status. Local orders may be more restrictive to respond to community conditions. So accordingly, I uh, please be aware of changing public health guidance and remember that as state representatives, we are all expected to adhere to state and local orders while carrying out our duties. Moving on to an update on remote meetings. On January 5th, Governor Newsom signed an executive order that extends the sunset date in Assembly Bill 361, allowing boards and committees to meet remotely through March 31st, 2022. And I'm happy to let you know that on January 31st, Assemblymember Cork introduced new legislation, AB 1733, which would permanently allow boards and committees to meet remotely while also providing both virtual and physical options for members of the public to participate. If this bill is passed by the legislature and signed by the governor, it would take place immediately. Next, a note about vaccination verification for in-person meetings. Well, since of course we cannot be certain that AB 1733 will be enacted or when, boards should prepare for the possibility of in-person meetings after March 31st. Before attending any in-person board meeting, members must verify full vaccination with DCA's Office of Human Resources or participate in COVID-19 testing. If any members have not yet done so, please submit your proof of vaccination. Your participation in this will assist DCA in planning for testing at future meetings. We request that you please do this as soon as possible and please don't hesitate to reach out if you need assistance. I want to express my appreciation for the flexibility of board members, staff, and the public as we have all navigated this changing pandemic together. And I am optimistic about the future and look forward to seeing you all in person one day. So now I'd like to transition to some updates from DCA, starting first with the regulations unit. The department's regulation unit was created in 2020 to address the regulatory needs of the department's boards, bureaus, and commission while also improving the quality of regulations. Prior to the unit's establishment, the department's boards and bureaus completed just 18 regulations in 2019. But after the unit was established, it delivered immediate results. The department more than tripled the number of regulations it completed in 2020 and 2021. And unlike prior years, none of the regulations were rejected by the State Office of Administrative Law. The unit, now in its third year, will continue to build on the success of the first two years and anticipates completing even more regulations this year. The unit has created new management tools that will continue to improve the process and help track from start to finish every regulation that will be completed this year so that there is complete transparency in the process. The department is looking forward to working with your board on another productive regulatory year. And next, an update on DCA's Enlightened Licensing Project. The Enlightened Licensing Work Group was formed in 2020 to utilize licensing subject matter experts within the entire Department of Consumer Affairs. The group's purpose is to help individual boards and bureaus streamline and make their licensing processes more effective and efficient by utilizing best practices, information technology, and cost-saving measures. The first deep dive, which was done for the Board of Registered Nursing, has completed, and a report will be released next month with recommendations that can be used by all boards and bureaus to continue to, uh, pardon me, to improve their processes. And after the successful first round, the work group will continue to begin uh, assisting other boards and bureaus. Next, I'd like to introduce DCA's new compliance and equity officer. As DCA looks to the future, Director Kirk Meyer continues to lead the department towards continual improvement and excellent service. DCA is pleased to announce that Tanya Corcoran has been selected to serve as the department's first compliance and equity officer effective March 2nd, 2022. Ms. Corcoran began, uh, pardon me, she brings invaluable expertise, insight, and years of hands-on experience with DCA's boards and bureaus to this new position, most recently having served as Chief Deputy Registrar at the Contractor State License Board. This position will oversee DCA's Solid Training and Planning, Organizational Improvement Office, Equal Employment Opportunity Office, and the Internal Audits Office. 
Bringing these offices together under Ms. Corcoran's experienced leadership will be a tremendous benefit, allowing DCA to better identify and analyze emerging issues department-wide and provide timely solutions to our divisions, boards, and bureaus. And finally, a reminder about required board member trainings in Form 700. And that reminder is, well, board members have training and reporting requirements. <laughs> um, each year, board members are required to file um, Pardon me, required by law to file a Form 700 before April 1st or face penalties from the FPPC. So DCA requests that you file as soon as possible. And as a tip, I'll let you know that the best way to avoid my reminder emails and phone calls is to file early. If anyone needs assistance, DCA's filing officer and legal counsel are available to help. Additionally, a general training reminder is that board members who were recently appointed or reappointed need to attend the board member orientation training or BMOT within a year of that appointment date. This training is also available to any interested board member as a refresher course. You can register for the BMOT through the Learning Management System, or LMS for short, which is DCA's training portal, and live virtual trainings will be held this year on March 9th, June 15th, and October 12th. And as always, Board and Bureau Relations is here to help you, so if there's anything we can do to assist your board, please do not hesitate to reach out to us. And that concludes my presentation, so I'll hand it back to Board President Tate. Thank you all for your time. Thank you so much. Um, board members, any questions or comments for Ms. Miller? Looks like we have a quiet group <laughs> this morning. Um, thank you, Ms. Miller, for your presentation. We appreciate you taking time to speak to our board. Thank you. We are moving on to agenda item number 19, the licensure committee report and consideration of committee recommendations. Chairperson of the licensing committee is Dr. Harp Sheets. Dr. Harp Sheets? Thank you. No. Guys. Oh, wait, hold on. I think I have to do public comment for oh. Ms. Miller. Is that correct? Is that why you have the screen up for me? That is correct. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Ms. Moderator, can you please open up public comment for Ms. Miller's presentation regarding the Consumer Affairs Update? Uh, this is the moderator and at the direction of the board, I have opened up the Q&A feature for public comment. Members of the public, if you would like to make a comment, please click that uh, Q&A icon located at the bottom right hand corner of your WebEx screen or use um, star three to raise your hand if you're a call in only participant. I'll pause a moment to allow the public time to access that and submit the requests. All right, seeing none, would you like me to close that Q&A panel? Absolutely, and thank you very much. Now we can move to agenda item number 19, the licensure committee report and consideration of committee recommendations. Dr. Harb Sheets. Thank you, Dr. Tate. Okay, well, um, we have uh, two parts to this report. We'll talk about our application workload reports and Ms. Chung will walk us through that. Uh, and then we will look at the proposed changes to pathways for licensure. Um, but I would like to start out by commenting on the, uh, there have been some conversations on a national listserv recently about various uh, state application processing times. And um, what I would like to say is that there are two parts to application processing. You'll see some of these in our workload reports, but there's also a piece about how um, easy is it for applicants to determine if their applications are complete um, or are there deficiencies? Uh, so those are the two parts. And I, from what I can see, our processing times are not unlike many other states who participated in this conversation. But I think, though, that we really excel in helping our applicants to find out 
the actual status of their application and it doesn't they don't find out way down the road that there are some deficiencies and Ms. Chung could say a little bit more about that but I want to thank our how we our licensing uh, section on their responsiveness to the needs of our applicants so with that I will turn it over to Ms. Chung to walk us through the various reports Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Harpshees. We appreciate your comments. Um, good morning, board members. Uh, we have made changes as recommended by the licensure committee to remove the statistics regarding registered psychologists from the report as this category has become obsolete due to the law change that became effective on January 1 this year. Um, so on the uh, on the memo, you may see that for license registration data by fiscal year, we're seeing an, um, a little bit of increase in the number of uh, current psychologists and psychological associates since the last report that we made to the board in uh, November. Uh, so there is a little bit of increase in current psychologists. Uh, there are about 140 of uh, more uh, new uh, current psychologists and then about 30 more uh, new psychological associates in our licensing population. Um, and you may refer to attachment A for more details about the breakdown for the different license statuses if you would like. And with that said, I also like to make just a verbal correction to the report. Um, there was an unintended inclusion of registered psychologists in the paragraph just right underneath the um, table of the fiscal year data. So I would uh, like to ask you to disregard that. Um, for the application workload reports um, on the psychologist uh, workload report that you may see in attachment B, um, you may see some um, activities in uh, December um, because we have been prioritizing the review of um, the EPPP eligibility and the request of initial licensure near the, near the end of the year so we can get our applicants um, to, to take the exam or become new licensee um, um, as soon as we can. So that you see a little bit more activity there in case you may be wondering what they are. Uh, for the psychological associate workload report, um, it does show a similar trend um, um, since our last report to the board um, in November. It's not much of difference there. On the examination statistics in attachment D, um, we see that candidates uh, who took the EPPP for the first time did better in December than previous month. And then for uh, candidates uh, for the law and ethics exam, they did a little less well in December, but um, the trend for the overall percentage pass rate for uh, both EPPP and the law, of, law and ethics exam are quite consistent, as we can see. And uh, I also want to like to touch on the uh, processing timeframes um, as shown in attachment E, and uh, thank you for Dr. Hapshis for her comments earlier. Um, so I want to say that uh, we did see an increasing trend of our timelines um, in the initial review of application over the last six months. Um, we're aware and have anticipated this uh, potential length and timeline when we began to uh, take the necessary steps to right size the budget of the board. Uh, one of the action was um, that we had to remove the temporary help that was um, uh, helpful with our application process. Um, so. Um, Though we're not able to get additional help um, with the process immediately because of uh, the budget impact, uh, we have and will continue to find efficiency and streamline our process, um, such as working through uh, the pathways regulations and make further enhancement to the brief functionality for to us applicants benefit. So one of the benefits is uh, one of the functionality that we have um, did is include um, a status check uh, for applicants that they can do. Um, what they can do is um, if they log into their breeze profile after they have filed an application online, um, it will show the status um, as pending. And then when uh, it has reviewed, uh, when the initial review is completed, they will be able to um, see um, if there's any deficiency um, that they may, need, they may need to address for the application type. Um, so that is um, just an example. 
And also, last but not least, I would like to take the opportunity to thank and recognize the licensing staff for their tenacity, continued dedication, and diligence in assisting our applicants to navigate through the licensure process um, all the time. I truly appreciate all their effort. And I'm happy to uh, answer any questions if you may have. Thank you. Hi, this is Dr. Tate. I just wanted to say thank you to you and your department. I know there's a lot of paper going through there and I appreciate your diligence. Thank you, Dr. Tate. Okay, thank you, Ms. Chung. Shall we move on to the continuing education report? Hi, good morning, board members. Did you want to take public comment on the last item? I thought we might take it after the continuing education report on the two okay. items before we move on to pathways. Is that okay? Sounds honky dory to me. Okay. Thanks. Uh huh. Good morning, board members. I will be presenting the continuing education and renewals report. Uh, CE audits for July through December 2021 were sent out January 6, 2022. The current pass rate for CE audits for January through December 2021 is 41%, with 40% of audits not yet received. The current CE waiver states licensees who expire between October 1st, 2021 and October 31st, 2021, have until March 28th, 2022, to complete all renewal-related CE requirements. The pass rate from 2016 through 2020 has been consistently over 80%. The pass rate for second audit has risen from 68% in 2016 to 94% in 2019. A goal from the strategic plan is to implement licensed board member audits. I would like to congratulate Dr. Tate, Dr. Kasuga, and Dr. Rogers on passing their CE audit. For renewals between January and December 2021, 81% of psychologists renewed as active. Approximately 89% of psychologists and psychological associates renewed their license using Breeze. And that brings us to the end. I'd like to thank you for your time and attention today. Would anyone like to ask any questions? Any board members have any questions? I have a question. Is it Dr. Cervantes? Yes. Yes, please go ahead. Um, I'm looking at Hold on a second. I have too many screens open. I am looking on page 27 of our combined packet. Could you tell me the time frame that the data on this chart represents? I wasn't clear what I was looking at. Uh, I don't have the, what's the title of it's that? A, it's it's Sorry. attachment A to, to the, Okay, the continuing education audits. Um, yes, I think licensing population report as of January 31st. I but it doesn't say, it, it just doesn't give like a time frame. Oh, Dr. Sarah, just I'm explain just, that. I, I think this is for Ms. Chung, but I, I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, Ms. Chung, this is a time frame. Um, for from since the beginning of licensure when you see the totals but please miss chung could you add to that yes absolutely yes uh that's um since uh it's all the data um, that we have in the system and then we ran it as of um, january 31st so you will see all the data that we have um, on attachment a for example you see we have 19,731 current psychologist, that is all the current psychologist uh, as of uh, January 31st when the report was ran. And so, then, then when you see the total, it means okay. we have licensed 32,468 psychologists 
in the, from the beginning. Does that clarify it? Okay. It, it just, I think it, it would just help if it said something like over the, over the lifetime or, or something of our, I just wasn't sure what I was looking at. Yeah. I can, I, I asked that same question at, at a point in the past too. I wondered the same thing. So I guess if we're, if we're asking the question, maybe, you know, just for, for transparency and for, so everyone kind of gets on the same page. Um, but thank you. I appreciate the clarification. Sure. Any other board member questions? Okay, Madam Moderator, could you please open the box for public comment on the licensing uh, workload reports and the continuing education reports? Uh, this is the moderator and at the direction of the board, I've opened up the Q&A feature for public comment. Members of the public, if you would like to make a comment on this item, please click that Q&A icon located at the bottom right hand corner of your WebEx screen. And if you are an audio only participant, you can indicate that you would like to make public comment by pressing star three on your device. Right now, it looks like we do have a couple individuals who have requested public comment. Um, I see a raised hand from individual identified as Dr. Monroe. Uh, Dr. Monroe will be requesting to unmute your microphone. Please click unmute me when the prompt appears on your device. Good morning. Good morning. Morning. Can, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Uh, good morning. Um, I'm Dr. Monroe, retired five years with an inactive license status, and I'm calling to address the retirement status license. Um, our PhD and license uh, has taken us years uh, to acquire and taken much time of our lives, piles of money uh, and student loans, and time away from our families and friends. Ergo, it is something to hold on to, as well as the future may change over life circumstances. More specific. Go ahead, please. I'm sorry to interrupt. Um, I think you're at wanting to speak about the category of retired license. Is that correct? Yes, I would also like to speak about the inactive, if I may, but more so the retirement status, which I was told I could comment on today. You can absolutely. That is um, after the pathways for licensure. That is the next item on the agenda. So that would be the perfect place to comment on that. OK. Is that, is that OK? Thank you. All right. Yes. I'll right, we'll stand by. Okay. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. All right. Uh, this is a moderator. I have a request uh, for comment from individual uh, Joe Linder Crow. All right. And uh, Ms. Linder Crow, I will request to unmute your microphone. Please click the unmute me button when the prompt appears on your device. Dr. Joe Linder Crow, I'm the CEO of the California Psychological Association. Um, I just wondered, Ms. Chung, if you could actually give us the processing time for license approval. And also, um, just because we get questions sometimes at CPA, uh, what is, so what is the actual processing time from application to licensure? And then what is the current um, time from like application to take the uh, ETPP, how long does it take to get notification that, that they can take the test? Is that possible? Dr. Hopsheets, would you like me to respond? Um, yes, I, I, I'd wanna just make one preface that I think you can address, which is um, that some of the the factors involved in that time frame is are based on the applicant itself that there are times when the applicant has been approved to take the e triple p but at times we've seen a year or more even pass 
before they actually do take it. So on that note, Ms. Chang, if you could um, add to that comment with some more specifics. Absolutely. Uh, thank you for the question. Um, so there are two parts of the questions that I was hearing. Uh, one part is um, from application to licensure. And then the second part is uh, the time that it took, uh, that it would take to um, get the eligibility for um, HRPB to be approved. Sure. So the yeah, okay, thank you. So the first part from application to licensure, so there are two parts to it. So one part is um, when applications are submitted to us uh, for processing, like how long on an average number of days that it would take um, take a document for us to get to our review. And then those time, like the, those average number of days, and we can kind of ref we can reference that uh, with the attachment E. Um, so, for example, um, it's taking about 52 days average for when an application is received um, to its being an, in, to an initial review is being completed. However, there's also um, the second part of the time that needed is because the licensure process is uh, applicant driven. So um, it really depends on when they when an applicant uh, scheduled to take the exam after uh, getting eligibility, uh, how long it will take for them uh, if something is missing to send to us, um, and how long they will take action. Oh, once they have passed all the exam, um, how long they will take us the necessary documentation, for example, um, course certificates uh, verification that they have met the license pre-licensure coursework um, requirements or like if there's any um, issues regarding their fingerprints um, that we are waiting information from them. So there are two parts and the time frame really vary and applicant driven so I cannot give like a time frame but but um, we can provide you with the number of average number of days that it take for a document for from its being received for us to process. Okay, that, that's what I wanted to know. I mean, basically, assuming that everything is in order, um, it would take a person about two months, let's say, to to get their license after everything has been completed. Is that what you're saying? Yes, yeah, so about if they have completed everything and then they submitted um, all their, um, all their documents, all the uh, requirements are met. So when they submitted the uh, requested licensure from us, currently it's taken about two and a half months uh, for us to issue them a license. Okay, great. Yes. And yes. Um, if I could ask just one more question, it, how about um, applications for psych assistants or now psychological associates? Oh, yeah. So that would be the same thing. Um, so when they submitted uh, an application to us, um, every, if everything is good to go, we will be issuing them uh, after we receive, um, I mean, like after like about, it currently takes about two and a half months for them to, for us to issue them. So as long as they have everything that is in place and there's no missing documents or whatnot. So once they get in queue, once we get it to, once we get to review them, they can be issued. Okay, great. And um, thank you for that information. And how does this compare, uh, last question, how does this compare to, let's say a year ago or two years ago? Is this is this about average two and a half months? Um, or is, is this a little bit longer than you have been in the past? Uh, it has been longer, um, as I've explained uh, a little earlier, uh, because um, of the budget impacts. Um, we have uh, we need to take steps to uh, right size the budget, so we have to remove um, a couple of uh, temporary staff that was uh, helpful to the process for um, the psychological associate registrations, and then we are not able to get any additional help immediately um, at this moment because we're still addressing the uh, budget issue. Um, so this time has lengthened compared to um, last year, I would say. Okay. Thank you very much. You're welcome.
All right, this is the moderator. It appears there are no further requests for public comment. Would you like me to close that Q&A panel? Yes, please. Okay, as we move into looking at the um, proposed amendments to pathways for licensure, um, I would like the, I would like Ms. Chung to please go through them with us, kind of lead us through them. And the question for the board is to consider approving these proposed amendments and delegating the staff to make any necessary changes in preparing the regulatory passage uh, package. Um, so Ms. Chung, if you could begin taking us through um, these comments and uh, then we will have some board comments and public comments. I'm so sorry, Dr. Harpsheets. I have my hand raised for uh, agenda item 19B. Oh, I'm um, so sorry. I didn't see that. I am so sorry. Yes. No worries. Mr. Fu, please. Thank Let's you so back. much. Yes. Uh, Ms. McCochran, I have a question about attachment 19B and specifically the uh, a bar chart on page three of six in the PDF file for um, the hand carry item. Um, I understand that currently at present um, we have 40% of um, audits to that your pending receipt or that haven't been completed yet. But are you able to detect whether or not this year or at this where we are at this point? In terms of that review, if we're going to be below the 80% mark in terms of passage rates. That is kind of hard to tell because of the CE waiver. So, although there was people who were deficient. Um, at this point, I can't really tell if it will be below below to be honest. Understood. So, um, if a, a follow up question to that is. Um, and I know there, there's the explanation there below about deficiency rates um, with regard to the CE waivers. So um, is it the correct understanding then that because of the waivers that we're seeing in 2020, that is a lower deficiency rate than usual because it will just carry over into um, the ongoing years based on the extensions that were provided in the various waivers? Uh, so, can you restate that question for me? I'm sorry. Sure, no worries. That was a poorly worded question on my part. So, for example, if I got, if I received a waiver uh, um, in terms of uh, C completions because of um, COVID, and I believe we extended the time to be able to accrue that on several occasions with these waivers, mm -hmm. that wouldn't show up until um, the expiration of those waivers, correct? So, if, if correct. Okay, yeah. so, and the expiration of those waivers was, remind me what date again? That's so, December 31st of last year, correct? The expiration of the waivers. Uh, so are you saying the time frame in which, oh, so, well, so the waivers ended January 26, 2022. So those were for people who were March 31st, 2020 through October or through September 30th, 2021. Their waiver ended January 26th of this year. And then for the month of October in 2021, their waiver will end will end March 28th, 2022. Understood. Okay, so that's when we'll start seeing whether or not we were able to hit those completions would be at those uh, natural time markers on the 26th and the 28th as yeah. stated in your report. Okay, that was really helpful. Thank you for walking me through the data and for the explanation. Okay, thank you. Um, now, because, um, Mr. Fu asked a question about continuing education. Do we need to open for public comment again? I suppose you could solicit comment. It doesn't hurt. Okay. Um, Madam moderator, could you please open the box for public comment? Uh, this is the moderator, and I have opened up the Q&A feature for public comment. Members of the public, if you would like to make a comment on this item, please click that Q&A icon located at the bottom right-hand corner of your WebEx screen. I'll pause a moment to allow the public time to access the Q&A panel and submit their requests. All right, seeing none, would you like me to close that Q&A panel? Please. 
Okay, we will move on to pathways for licensure. And again, um, I would, these are, these proposed amendments were discussed at the January licensure committee meeting, and we are bringing them to the board asking for a review and approval of these amendments and a, uh, delegating to staff to make any necessary changes in preparing the regulatory package. So Ms. Chung, if you could walk us through the changes, um, uh, that would be very helpful. Thank you. Sure. Um, so um, we have provided, um, uh, would you mind, uh, would you like me to give a little bit brief background on uh, how we uh, have asked the board to review this uh, item? Sure. Dr. Hapjit? Okay. Sure, that I'll do that. Thank you. Um, so it's been a while uh, since we have, since the board has looked at pathway. So I just want to give some content uh, so that we kind of remind us where, uh, how we have come here. Um, so the pathways um, propose amendments in both the statutes and the regulations. Um, they were um, started up by a staff back in 2014. Um, so with the intent to uh, reduce barriers to licensure, eliminate confusion and streamline the process. And eventually it has also become one of the licensing goals um, as part of the board's strategic plan. Um, so these changes have already been looked at by both the licensure committee and board members multiple times in the past. And um, they were approved uh, at the November 2018 board meeting by the full board. Um, so after the approval, the board uh, has to obtain the necessary statutory changes through legislation. And then, so these are materialized uh, through the Senate bill, uh, SB 801, um, this year, which was signed by the governor and became effective uh, on January 1. Um, so now we have got the uh, statutory authority. Now we are working um, to us uh, making those uh, regulatory changes and um, getting pre prepared for um, the regulatory package. So um, before doing that, we did, um, board staff did another um, additional review um, in last year uh, in preparation. And then when, as we go through the language, we have uh, proposed uh, some additional amendments um, to hopefully further remove any uh, uh, barriers identified, uh, provide additional clarity and uh, hopefully um, efficiency during our um, during the uh, additional amendments. Um, so um, at the licensure committee meeting, uh, as mentioned by Dr. Hapshis in January, um, they have tasked us to um, do uh, 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 have a, a few following items for us to do. Um, so they're listed uh, in the memo and the three bullets. Um, so they are um, clarifying the definitions for real-time licensee, um, eliminate the specifications of uh, general bias psychologists and health services psychologists uh, in the language, and then uh, make one make uh, changes to um, proposed uh, form as well. Um, so we have highlighted um, these changes um, in the uh, attachment A, which you can also um, be seeing on the screen in front of you. Uh, so we have, we'll be asking the board members to focus on the uh, changes that were made um, in yellow highlights. So that is the background of, um, of the, uh, this item. So um, Dr. Hapshis, would you like us to start with the um, following follow-up items uh, tasked to us by the licensure committee last time? First, or would you like to go section by section? I'm sorry, I was muted. Um, yes, please, let's go section by section. Okay, we can do that. Um, so the first changes um, are found in the 1380.3 definitions. Um, so these are the changes that were made. Thank you, Evan. Uh, thank you, Mr. Gage. 
Um, so you see here, uh, we have a stricken D um, and then we have refined uh, the new D um, to include a, a reference to address the um, first, uh, uh, to address the uh, one of the following items, but one of the follow-up items by tasked to us by the committee is to make clarifying changes uh, to this definition. So if you have any discussion or comments, uh, feel free to raise them. So the, the and question, yeah, so the question here is, what does licensee actually mean? And we were trying to be consistent with business and professions code, uh, and that's how we came up with this definition. And, um, and then, since this is part of it, there were these um, categories, general applied psychologist and health service psychologist, which as a committee, we felt like was would be very confusing to the public and didn't accurately um, convey what these various specialty areas, um, actually what people did with those specialty areas. So we asked that these be struck. So at, since it's in this section, are there any comments from board members? I don't hear any board member comments, so let's go to the next section, Ms. Chung. Absolutely. Um, the next, excuse me, the next section is um, 1381 applications. Um, so um, staff has proposed to um, add these sections here, subsections here, um, to clarify and incorporate it uh, and incorporate some forms in, in by reference. Um, so to make it clear for um, for applicants what forms are needed uh, in each step uh, for their uh, licensure process. So you see we have a list of the forms and what's necessary. Uh, to take the EPPP, to um, take the Law and Ethics exam, the Kapli, and then if you may scroll down a little bit, Mr. Gage, thank you, um, and then uh, what is necessary for uh, when they are uh, applying for the licensure, which is the last step after taking the exams, and then uh, for those who have uh, taken and passed the issue be somewhere else or um, have already licensed in another state, uh, what is necessary for them to uh, submit to us to uh, begin their licensure process. Okay, I see Dr. Saravantes um, is unmuted. Dr. Saravantes, did you have something you wanted to comment on in the previous section or this section? Uh, no, my I apologize. I didn't realize that. Sorry. Okay. Um, okay, I don't see any board members uh, with questions on this section, so if we could go to the next section. So 1381.1, Abandonment of Applications. So this section, uh, it was uh, reworded um, to uh, merge uh, this section and the later section 1381.5 um, to make it clear because uh, they seem redundant, but their uh, policy are actually consistent. So uh, we have suggested to merge these two sections into one, make it more concise, but retaining the uh, direction uh, re to be consistent with the po policy. Okay. All right. Um, I, that's pretty straightforward. Um, let's do the, um, next, uh, few sections there. And I think, um, yeah, let's do the next section. And then I think we have a ways to go to get into anything else substantive. So failure to pay an initial fee. So we have stricken 1381.5, which was merged uh, with the um, preceding sections that you were looking at. And then uh, I can go through the, uh, and then the next few sections, 1382, uh, if you scroll down a little bit. So this is just non-substantive changes made to this section. 
1382.3, this section as well on the screen. And then the next section about um, child abuse assessment, pre-licensure coursework requirement, we just made a reference change because of the law change at uh, C, there you go. And then 1382.5 as well. So these are non-substantive changes. Okay. So, um, and then 1386 um, was, uh, as I recall, non-substantive also. And 1387 is when we look at uh, supervised experience. And I think if you could share what changes were made there, I think those are some significant changes. Will do. Um, so if you may scroll down Mr. Gage to the highlighted portion. Thank you, right there. Um, so in this section, we have added clarifying language of um, what is necessary for um, verification if they're in the uh, respective uh, exam setting. So we have uh, bring this language uh, inconsistent with um, the uh, changes uh, made uh, by SB 801, um, which it, the uh, which we mirror what is necessary uh, as provided in the addendum on the advisory for the uh, legislative changes, and then uh, we mirror those um, in short, uh, direction and guidance here. So um, to make clarified um, in our rec right language what is necessary. So for example, if they're in, in an internship placement, um, they will have to submit um, their verification uh, of their internship status um, to accrue um, uh, their uh, supervised professional experience. So we gave an example, what can be uh, a verification would be if they have an internship course um, enrollment on their transcript, then it could serve um, as a verification to us. And then the next highlight would be uh, the example of uh, if they're operating under uh, the waiver, like the DMH waiver that is, uh, we have known and called them um, as authorized by the Welfare and Institution Code um, um, to accrue experience, they would just need to provide with us a waiver. We, we get them already, but um, it's helpful to uh, specified and clarified in language uh, that they need to submit to us so to um, expedite the process and then we don't have to let them know and contact them and to wait uh, for them to submit it to us for uh, further processing. Ms. And Ch then, um, yes. Uh, this is Shakanda Rogers. I just had a question about section A. Um, where it seems that APA and APIC and KPIC accreditation has been removed. Um, has that been removed in order to remove the barriers to licensure? Uh, yes, um, so that was um, actually a change made uh, by um, uh, SB 801. So um, the bill expanded um, how, um, uh, how an individual can accrue uh, pre-doctor experience. So uh, excuse me that I didn't uh, specify that these changes of a pre-doctoral experience that we're seeing on the screen. Um, so it expanded from the expanded the exemption for um, this individual to accrue pre-doctoral hours not just when they're in an official internship with um, the or, uh, with the professional associations that overseeing those uh, internship, but also to um, graduate students who are um, in, enrolling in a qualified uh, doctoral degree program. So that's why uh, we don't necessarily need those um, exemption here specified only for the associations anymore. Understood, thank you so much. You're welcome. And then so as we uh, talked about postdoc here, 
Um, so we just asking for similar verification to let them to let us know that uh, they're in a formal postdoctoral training placement. So um, they're exempted from to verify that they their exemption uh, to verify that they're exempted from registration with the board in accruing hours. And then the last one about verification materials is um, the same thing uh, because uh, postdoctors uh, individual earning postdoctoral hours, they can utilize the waiver as well. So we would like to have that waiver um, to be submitted to us for verification so that we don't have to ask them to uh, send it to us when we received hours that are verified under um, stating that they're accrued under the waiver. And then if you would like me to continue to go um, explain the next highlights here is um, in C6. Yes, please. It's page 14. Okay, right there. So uh, we see the stricken language here. Um, the reason why is that we have incorporated this um, details into the form. As I have explained to you on in section, I believe 1381. So on those forms, uh, we will have this is talking about the verification of experience form specifically. So we have uh, included these details onto that form. So it's not necessary to have the language written out again. So for um, for ease of reading here. So I think that's the changes for that section, if you may have any question. Yep. Um, I don't see any other mics open. So yes, let's please go on. Okay, so um, UC 1387.10 is um, the next highlight. Uh, so we want to clarify that uh, what are the requirements, supervision requirements for um, a trainee, even though they have uh, finished accruing hours. Excuse me. So uh, we just make a reference back to um, the uh, what is the supervision requirements for them uh, in this section to clarify. Yeah, I think we can move on. Okay. And then the next section is on is about um, we make a reference change um, to uh, use the correct to use the current name of the brochure, um, and then also uh, to make corrections to uh, the reference to the ethics code. So these are non-substantive changes in this section. So I think right here at thirteen eighty seven point two. You can, if you can share with us some of the conversation about that. This is, I think, a substantive change we'll want to pay attention to. Um, so, please, Ms. Chung. Yes. Uh, so we have uh, added the uh, definition, or um, yeah, the definition for real time. Um, what does it mean uh, when it's reference uh, about supervision uh, modality? So we have mentioned it here that uh, real time requires the ability to see and hear synchronously, either in physical proximity or remotely in compliance with federal and state laws relating to confidentiality of patient health information. So um, we work with uh, rec, uh, our rec council for that. Thank, thank you for uh, Ms. Hokinson's help in uh, coming up with the language um, to make clarification to uh, include um, the element of uh, audiovisual in this definition. And uh, we think that this um, is uh, clear and concise. Yes. And happy to answer any questions. And Ms. Hoganson would be available for questions too, um, if you may have any for any technical um, questions that she would be able to help us. And I, I think that word we moved down and there are other not generally non substantive changes and the the uh, words real time um, are are added in uh, subsequently to where appropriate. Um, and then I think 1386.6. Um, and I think that can you 
remind us what that 1386.6? Yes, uh, that is page, uh, I think, 20, 28, 28. 28 of the uh, document. Uh, Mr. Gitch, can you go down to a few more pages down, please? To 1388.6, which is uh, twins, yes. page 28 of uh, the document that you have. Almost there, right there. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Gage. And so uh, we did a review of this section. Um, so we looked in totality of this section. It seems that the policies, board policies, is to require the score transfer uh, of the ECCPB for all applicants who have already taken and passed the ECCPB. So that's why we have. Um, stricken the yellow highlights and just rewrite reword it to make it to clarify that uh, the score transfer is necessary uh, for applicants if they have taken and passed age will be somewhere else okay i think the rest of the changes are non-substantive um i want to point out on the forms that you'll see in this um, document that the requirement to submit a supervision agreement has been uh, deleted. Uh, and Ms. Chang, are there any other substantive changes um, that you can think of um, or that are on the forms themselves? Um, that is, uh, I think you have included that and uh, I don't recall any more additional uh, substantive changes on the form. There are not, are you saying there are or there are not? No, they are not. Okay, great. Um, I let's take it's ten fifty six. Um, how about if we take a ten minute break and come back at eleven o six, and then we will take board comments uh, and then open up for public comment. Uh, Dr. Tate, does that sound okay with you? That sounds perfect, thank you. Okay. 11.06. 11.06, great, thank you very much. This meeting is being recorded. Thank you for starting the recording. Okay. All right. It is 11.06. And let's just call the roll, Ms. Brito, to make sure everyone is back. Thank you. Kasuga. Here. Cervantes. Here. Who? Hi. Barb Sheets. Here. Nystrom. Here. Phillips. Here. Riscate. Here. Rogers. Here. Tate. Here. Thank you. Everyone is back and thank you for that. Um, we are in agenda item number 19 and Dr. Harv Sheets, please continue. Thank you, Dr. Tate. Okay, um, since we've gone through the proposed amendments, I'd like to open it up for board comment. Any board members who would like to comment, question, uh, make suggestions? Dr. Rogers, I see your hand up. Thank you so much, Dr. Harb Sheets. Um, I have a question about the forms um, for the application to take the EPPP. 
on page 71 and the out of state application um, on page 82 of the combined packet. Um, I was just wondering um, where it is asking for um, information like name and address and all of that, um, where it says sex, um, is there any way to make that question more gender inclusive? That's a good question. Um, Ms. Chung uh, or, and um, Ms. Hoganson, is there anything you can add or respond to that? Hi, uh, this is uh, Ms. Chung. Um, Yes, I think we can make uh, changes. I think the system currently allows us, um, that's a very good question, because I think it allows us to uh, have a third option, says non-binary. Um, I think we can include that here as well on all our forms. Okay, fantastic. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thank you for that. Thank excellent, you. excellent okay. comment. Okay, um, Dr. Cervantes. Um, thank you. I, I just want to thank um, Ms. Chung, her team, and uh, the licensure committee for their work. I don't have any uh, comments on the language. I think it really, I think what we reviewed really reflects a lot of the ongoing conversations that we've been having since I joined the board um, after that initial, after 2018. Um, and so I appreciate seeing that. My comments are regarding the form. Um, I visually and by and for process, I really appreciate that the forms have um, bullets that say, um, like I'm looking at page 70 of our combined packet that say step one, step two, step three. I think that is, um, helpful for applicants who um, may not be familiar with our um, our government processes. And so I appreciate seeing that. One of the things that I did not see here on, on the form that we have on page 70 is I did not see a reference to the $600 uh, testing fee for the E triple P. And I wonder if we could add that and if we could add um, on this initial form that an applicant may receive some uh, more transparency about what fees they might expect as they're going through the licensure process. Because as I reviewed the, the entirety of these forms, it's and some of the other forms do have the test fee on them, it seems um, like the applicant gets this information in a, like, a, like, a, like in phases and not, not all at once so that they could plan ahead that the next part is gonna cost however much. Um, does that make sense? Could we, could we make those changes? I think that's just the staff. So, so um, you're so you're asking that where we say on page seventy the application mm -hmm. to take E triple P form, um, mm -hmm. the first thing says obtaining eligibility and completing the application. Uh, could we include the E triple P cost, which we mm -hmm. don't charge? That that's through um, ASPPB um, on there, and. Mm -hmm. And then a the second part, is there some place we could give the applicants information on the current, at, at any point in time, the current costs as we understand them for the various um, uh, steps they will have to take, applications, testing, that kind of thing. Two parts, yeah. right? Yeah, because, because the fees, um, and even though the, the, E triple P fee does not come to us. Um, the applicant comes to us, and so they may not know the difference. And mm -hmm. so, even just having some transparency about what, how, what fees they're going to incur, 
I think would be helpful, one, for transparency, and two, to help them understand where they are in the process, because, and it, it came up earlier, I, uh, sometimes, because this is an applicant-driven process, sometimes they get, um, they can hold up the process themselves, and it may be, if we help them anticipate what to expect, we might help them in that process, is what I'm thinking. Yeah, I'm wondering, Ms. Chung, is there any um, point before this application where, uh, say, on our website, um, we could uh, provide a chart of potential fees uh, that, it, you know, is there some place that already exists that we could add something like that in there? Yes, uh, uh, our fee schedule is on our website already, but I think that would be helpful if we um, can, and then we can, and we are working to update our FAQs as well. I think we can add that information about um, expected costs, or I, I want to say it's expected costs, uh, like on the exam, I kind of refer them to uh, let them know uh, the fee schedule and then so to so they can expect, oh, these are the additional fees that uh, you will need to uh, pay uh, after you're for scheduling the exam um, to the vendor directly or information like that. So I think that would be helpful. Would that be okay if we do that? Dr. Cervantes, would that do? Because it sounds like everybody has to start there anyway. So they're going to see it right away. Yeah, I think, and I think another important piece of that communication is that the the applicant uh, doesn't pay, for example, twelve hundred dollars up front. Like you pay your applicant fee, you pay this fee, you pay, then you go to the next phase. Yeah. And so I think that part of it, because if I just look at the fees at the fee schedule, it does. It's not clear to me to me that that it's not all due at once. And so, so I, I'm, I'm just um, thinking that if the applicant has more of that information on the front end, it could help them anticipate the phases. So what, whatever that looks like, I would like to see the e triple P fee on this form so that it's consistent and and with it with an indication that that fee is not to us, but they must do it, you know, wherever wherever that happens. So maybe add some wording that says um, obtaining eligibility um, at some point where we say to, um, and then pay the, well, when would they pay that fee? Um, Ms. Chung, when actually would they pay that fee that we could add a sentence to pay the applicable fee uh, to ASPPB? So if I could interject, this is uh, your regulatory counsel, Heather Hoganson. Uh -huh. yes. uh, the Office of Administrative Law recently did require another board to remove a reference to a third party fee uh -huh. that had a, a, a reference because they thought, well, the public doesn't have a, a chance to comment on what this fee should be. And, and DCA's response is, well, this is a contracted vendor. We, we don't control their fee. And we ultimately had to remove the reference in order to get it approved by the Office of Administrative Law. Oh, so, that's very useful information. Thank you. Yes. So, so while it's, you know, if you want to put it in a frequently asked questions because it's objectively exists, um, you know, on the website, that would be, that would be fine with, with the steps. Um, but I would, I would caution against putting it in the form. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. I yeah. Okay. okay. Well, there we have our answer, I guess, Dr. Okay. Cervantes, on that part of it. And I just, I just have a couple other uh, just comments on the forms real quick, if I may. Yes, sure. Okay. So on this form here on page 70 as well, I, I guess I just want to reiterate um, my concern with the fees is just, um, and I, I don't, I like the way that these forms are laid out because it, it gives you the phases of the process. And then it goes further to say step one, step two, step three, which I, I appreciate. Um, but, but I just think an applicant needs 
like to know, uh, needs a little bit more anticipation of what each phase costs, um, wh whatever that looks like. I just want to reiterate that. I think okay. We, should, we will take that into um, account when, uh, when we develop that part of the website mm -hmm. and the FAQs to make sure, I think that's an important point that they know they're not all at once and at what step am I going to be expected to pay this and then that. Thank you for that. Okay, and then I just have uh, a couple more and, and these are faster, I promise. <laughs> so on page 70, the third bullet the board notifies all applicants upon receipt of their application to take the e -triple -P. Could we add a reference that the board notifies the applicants via email? Um, I, think, I think it's important. Um, I, I just think it's important that they know that. Uh, Ms. Chung, do we notify them by email and mail? Uh, Postal mail, how do they get notified? Uh, it's by email. We can definitely add that. Okay, great. And then just uh, one, one more on a form here. Give me one second. I'm just scrolling down to get to my comment here. On page 78, in the first bullet, it says, after passing, this is the application to take the complete. And the first bullet says, after passing the examination for professional practice of psychology, the EPPP, blah, 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 obtain eligibility to take the pass, the California, the complete, is the second step towards licensure. I wonder if we could change that word right there, the second uh, step to um, make, maybe second phase towards licensure or or some way to um, differentiate the word step right there because then you have step one step two step three underneath um, just so that the applicant does not confuse the two so maybe if we could change I, I don't know if that's the right if phase is the right word but if we could change um, the word step in that first bullet to something different so as to differentiate it from the following bullets. Okay. Um, okay. Um, I will, I'm writing that down and perhaps that it, in, when we make a motion, we can um, add that to the motion as something we would delegate to staff to determine a more appropriate word or a less confusing word. How does that sound? Uh, perfect. Okay. Um, anything else, Dr. Cervantes? Uh, no, those were my two. Thank you, oh, okay. Thank you. Um, Mr. Fu. Thank you, Dr. Harpsheets. Um, I would like uh, us to, I have a question related to page 28 of 34 in the regulations review document in attachment A, or also page 63 of 162 in the combined PDF. Okay. You said page 63? Of 162 in the combined PDF. Uh-huh. Um, it's section 1388.6, um, Ms. Chung since I know you're controlling the screen and you're not using the PDF. Thank you, Mr. Fu. Uh, Mr. Gage has the screen and he appreciate that information. Thank you. No worries. Um, so this is with regard to uh, satisfaction of licensure requirements. Um, and in our, and I know this is lifetime editing, so you're probably not the right, there we go. You're right where we need to be. Thank you so much, Mr. Gage. So um, question here with regard to the reference to the EPPP licensure and in reference to it being taken in another state. So, um, and I need a refresher on this, Dr. Herb Sheets, but there are other states that are doing two parts to the EPPP at present. And are they, when a score is sent to us, do we get both scores 
or do we just get the score for, or does the um, applicant send the score for the part one exam only? We, at this point, we only get the part one exam and uh, we responded to the survey that we would not be want, expecting to get the part two. There was some concern that if we were to get it, and we're not actually even, we don't even have the capacity to get the part two, but there was some concern that if we did, it could somehow prejudice the licensing process in California for that applicant, where at this point, the EPPP2, as it's called today, is um, not required. So no, we just get the, what's now today known as the part one, which may ultimately change. Um, and I think we'll take that up at the next board meeting when we have more information on that. Does that, answer, does that answer the question? Uh, it, it kind of, in the sense that I'm curious what will happen if, obviously depending on what the board decides to do with the EPPP exam, but if there was an, a case where an out-of-state applicant or out-of-jurisdiction applicant, I should say, because it's inclusive of our Canadian provinces as well, um, submits an exam score that is a, that indicates they filled the part two exam, um, but passed part one, huh? um, what are the implications for us in terms of our consumer protection role and um, well, liability is a strong word, right? But I'm, I'm just curious, like given this regulation as the language here, um, what that would mean for us in the event that we did get a notification of a fail of a part two by the passage of part one. I think that it gets back to that California requires that EPPP one, as it's known today, uh, for licensure. And so whatever happens on the EPPP two for that applicant is not considered relevant for California because it's not required. And um, if I remember right too, we don't even have the ability to record uh, or to, to um, process an EPPP2 score. Ms. Chung could, uh, could correct me if I'm wrong on that. Um, you know, as we know, the ASPPB board is supposed to meet this month um, to decide whether or not they want to make the two parts mandatory. Um, and that will be something, of course, that we would decide uh, down the road how California is going to handle that. Um, so I, my understanding and maybe, uh, maybe uh, board council or Ms. Hoganson can add to that is that since the second part at this point, it's not required for licensure here, and we have decided the uh, EPPP-1, as it's called today, um, is all that's necessary. It wouldn't matter to us if they had failed the Part 2. Now, Board Council, could you please comment on that, if whether that's a correct assumption? Hi, part, this is board count. For these purposes, um, your regulatory council is essentially, uh, let's see, I'm gonna defer to Ms. Hoganson here, if you're there. Ms. Hoganson? Uh, thanks. If, if it is determined that, that you don't need that further information, we can, we can remove it. Um, it's, and your motion can just reflect that your uh, delegating to staff the ability to make the edits in accordance with today's discussion and, and in consultation with the department and agency. Um, so the question I think is if in this section 1388.6 where it indicates if they take the applicant has taken and passed the EPPP for licensure in another state, um, if they submit to us a score for EPPP2, which is not required for licensure in California, but they happen to be in a state that offers it. And they have, for example, failed the EPPP2. Um, and uh, do we have any liability uh, in California by not including or taking into account 
that information. Um, and my response to Mr. Fu was because California only requires the EPPP uh, for licensure in the state, so the part one, as it's called today, that it wouldn't matter to us, that it would be irrelevant to us how they performed on the EPPP too. And is that correct or, um, or is there more to it than that? Wait, if, if you're not requiring it, then, then it's, it's kind of irrelevant whether or not they've passed or failed it if it's not part of your requirements. Okay. That, does that answer it for Mr. Fu? Uh, it, it does, but I will just note that in the statute reference the EPPP as one exam, it doesn't yes. distinguish between one and two. So while we may not presently require it, if it's designated by others that the exam is one exam, it yeah, becomes yeah. an issue for us. So I, I just would point that out. You're um, right. I mean, I think um, that we have acknowledged that and we're kind we're waiting to see uh, if ASPPB will uh, determine that it there's a part one and a part two and will they call it the EPPP and it's comprised of two parts, or will they be two separate exams referred to separately? And that will certainly affect how this is written down the road, but we're not there yet. Understood. And, and one one other final item, because I suspect this will be needed, is um, I'm happy at this time to make a motion to approve the additional proposed amendments um, and delegate to staff um, for edits in accordance with today's discussion and, and, in, and, and in consultation with the department and agency. Um, um, with, I, do you want to do that yet? Ms. Nystrom also has her hand up, and so she may, we may have some additional com, um, changes. Sure, I can wait for that. Sorry, yes. I didn't see that. Yes. Okay, and then so hold on to that. That would be great. Okay, Ms. Nystrom. Um, I just had one quick question. I know that, um, that for renewal licenses, uh, Board of Psychology went to paper light. I was just curious if, if the history of being able to do, um, with respect to the forms, to be able to do the applications uh, paper light as well. I think they are done online, but Ms. Chung, could you um, comment on that, please? Yes. Uh, is it about the renewal or like the new applications that we have here? Sorry, Ms. Nystrom. I just um, want to make I sure I understand. Oh, sure. I was referencing the renewal, but I am talking about the new uh, application for license. Got it. Got it. Thank you for the clarification. Yes. So it's our goal to uh, make all the applications here that you see online. And of course, when that happens, we will make uh, necessary uh, changes to the forms to include uh, information about like online uh, submission instructions or um, just to let them know that uh, they can submit online as well. Okay, I appreciate that. And when um, when do you hope uh, to be able to put those online just after they're approved? Yeah, um, so yes, probably after it's approved, it's easier to um, have regulations in place to uh, make changes in briefs because of the uh, specificity of what is necessary to um, to uh, create a new, uh, new transaction for each application. So, um, it's good to have the specificity specificity in regulations to help us in crafting that. Okay, that's helpful. I appreciate that information. Um, thank you. Sure. Okay. Thank you. Um, okay, so Mr. Fu um, has a motion. Can we do a motion and a second and then open up for public comment? Is that okay to do it that way? That's the preferred way, I think, Dr. Harp. She just has the motion on the table. Okay, okay, Mr. Fu. Please make your motion. Sure. So I would like to um, move to approve the language um, and to delegate to staff um, the, for uh, in accordance with today's discussion and in consultation with the department and agency for any technical non-substantive edits. I second. Okay. Thank you. So may, motion by Mr. Fu. Was that um, was that Dr. Kasuga? Sorry. Correct. Thank you. Okay, so um, Madam Moderator, could you please open the box for public comment? 
This is the moderator and at the direction of the board, I've opened up the Q&A feature for public comment. Uh, members of the public, if you would like to make a comment on this item, please click the Q&A icon look at the bottom right hand corner of your WebEx screen. Right, it looks like we do have a couple individuals who've requested public comment. Uh, we'll start with uh, Elizabeth Winkleman. And um, Ms. Winkleman, I will request to unmute your microphone. Please click the unmute me button when the prompt appears on your device. Hi, this is Dr. Elizabeth Winkleman. I'm with the California Psychological Association. Um, first, I want to thank the Board of Psychology and the staff for all the work they've done on the Pathways to Licensure, and I appreciate the opportunity to comment. I do have one comment and uh, request that you consider the um, first changes. If perhaps you could bring it up on the screen, I think it would be easier to understand my comment about the definition of licensee. Is that possible during the uh, public comment? Yes, one moment. I'm passing over um, presenter status to um, the staff. Thank you. Right, there okay. we go. Great. So I'm concerned that the new uh, highlighted definition of licensee is uh, confusing and in fact inconsistent with other regulations. So I, I understand that it's consistent with the more general BPC 23.7, but currently the language of D and E covers the psychological associates in both places. In other words, Section D says licensee means a psychologist or registered psychological associate. And then E says trainee means a psychology trainee working under supervision as specified in section 1387. Well, in fact, 1387 also includes psychological associates as trainees. So, um, so I don't, so I, I think it's very confusing to define a psychological associate both as a licensee and as a trainee. Um, furthermore, there's, I didn't like completely review all the regulations, but in addition to 1387 referring to including uh, psychological associates among the uh, individuals defined as trainees, also 1391.6 refers to psychological associates as unlicensed, that the uh, supervisor must <clears throat> let the patients know that the psychological associate is unlicensed. So um, that's the one section that I just wanted to comment on. And as I said, I find it very confusing and inconsistent with other regulations. And uh, I don't see how a person can be defined in both D and E. Um, Ms. Hoganson, can you please respond to that? Yes, yeah, so the, just because someone is a, a trainee does not mean they, they aren't covered under the Business and Professions Code as, so just as a refresher, Business and Professions Code section 23.7 defines licensee as someone who's holding a, um, the license is defined as a license, certificate, registration, or other means to engage in a business or profession regulated by this code or uh, referred to in the code. So the trainee could in fact be subsumed under that definition. And, and because we are calling them out to make clear to people that because they're working in supervision, it's under 1387. I don't think that is inconsistent with the rest of the regulations. Now, Dr. Winkleman, you brought up a subsequent um, regulation that sounded maybe was inconsistent. Could you remind us of that? Well, sorry, uh, Dr. Harpsheets, did you ask, was that a question to me? Yes, yes. Oh, it, you yes. mentioned, yeah, did okay. you hear the question? So, yes, it was 1387, as I said, includes psychological assistance among people that are identified as trainees. So, 1387 and 1391.6. And in addition, I understand uh, the, I'm well aware of the other BP, B, uh, Business and Professions Code section that does say that the licensee 
can include or does include these other categories. However, my understanding is that a more specific law or regulation would uh, prevail. If you have a separate law or regulation that's more specific, then that would um, that would be uh, the one that would govern the definition. So, um, I hear what I see what you're saying. We see on the screen the key word uh, section B. Uh, registered psychological associate is unlicensed and I can see what you're saying that that's inconsistent with the earlier section that we're looking at that defines a, a registered psychological associate as licensed is that correct. that's the point you're making correct correct and also the 1387 point mm -hmm. uh, that, that they are among the trainees and in terms of lack of confusion to the public and to the train and to the supervisors and supervisees, I just feel that all previous, all the previous laws and regulations that are specific to psychology mm -hmm. have not called the trainees who are registered psychological associate licensees in the past, as far as I know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, it, so if we were, I mean, if, if we start with that under the Business and Professions Code uh, cited at the beginning of this um, and accept, okay, we're going to call them licensees and in this case struck the words in Section B, struck the words as unlicensed, uh, but just is under the supervision and direction. Um, would that make it less problematic? I just think that the that the whole new change should be struck because I find this new change is really confusing rather than clarifying. And although that Business and Professions Code 23.7 has been in existence for a while, so have all the other laws and regulations and policies of the board that say that the trainees, including psychological associates, are unlicensed. That has also been in existence, so I, I see that this proposed change is is confusing and not clarifying, and I don't see that it's necessary. So how how would you suggest that this read? We have we define licensee, and then we define trainee. And licensee means a psychologist licensed by the board, and trainee means uh, a psychological a psychology trainee. Is that what yes. you're suggesting? Yes. I would suggest that you just simply undo the proposed changes to uh, go to the previous language prior to this highlighted change where it says licensed or licensed psychologist means a psychologist licensed by the board. Then E would be trainee, means a psychology trainee working under supervision as specified in 1387. And Ms. Hoganson, can you please comment on that for us? I mean, the issue becomes whether or not registered psychological associates have the same obligations under these regulations as as some of the the obligations imposed on psychologists. And I think if you do not cover them both, there will be some unintended consequences. You guys can back me up. Um, so, you're, are you saying, Ms. Hoganson, that if we don't define the psychological associate as, a li as licensed by the board in some way, there could be some consequences to us that somehow it takes away some responsibilities that they may have um, and that uh, that would be the kinds of consequences that they would not have certain level of responsibilities in the care in the conduct and how they conduct their work and for public protection Cor correct it is a public protection issue that you definitely want your registered psychological associates to be obligated to to these regulations and the idea that they are not licensees doesn't make sense um, legally mm. mm -hmm. I think well, I think as a, a board member, uh, would there be any board members who would like to comment on that? Add to that discussion. 
Um, Dr. Harpsheets, may I make one more uh, clarification first? Sure. sure. Yes, I would just say that currently the trainees have many obligations upon them, as do the supervisors who are responsible for the trainees. And I'm again not aware of any problems with the lack of oversight of trainees. And this is just a change in the term that I don't believe would meet bring meaningful um, additional or needed uh, oversight of the psychological associates. Yeah. Um, and, but if I am wrong, if there if there is a feeling from the board that they are currently not able to properly uh, regulate the psychological associates, then that would certainly be an issue to be addressed. But I am not aware of that ever having been a problem. And I believe there's quite a lot of oversight mechanisms and re legal responsibility of both the trainees and their supervisors. Thank you. I understand. I understand what you're saying. Um, I saw Dr. Phillips had his microphone. Yes, his hands up. Dr. Phillips, please comment. Thank you, Dr. Harpsheets. Um, it, it, my understanding based having been on several different committees of the board is that more and more of our regulations are going toward using the term licensee in the way that it is used in these regulations, and that is the licensee covers both psychological associate and uh, licensed psychologist. So I think this is consistent with the trend in terms of our use of language. Since we are using the word licensee in so many other regulations, I think it would be problematic for, have, for us to have to go back and unpack all those regulations. Um, perhaps, uh, perhaps Ms. Sora could comment on that because that's my understanding, but perhaps she has a different perception. Ms. Sora. Hi, yes, I, I, um, we, we could delete D and just apply the 23.7, um, interpretation on the other sections and just reference licensee as we have in our draft enforcement regulations but i just from a staff perspective i think this is consistent with the general provision um, to have licensee incorporate both and the example i'll give is um, you know 2960 of our business and professions code deals with unprofessional conduct and that law applies to both um, and it doesn't specify to both but we want to make sure that the people that have oversight which is just two categories um, can be incorporated and um, I think this language does it but um, if we need to just delete it and like I said interpret the general provision we can just do that i just I, i'm i'm still not getting the the concern and the confusion but that's just me being a staff person not understanding um dr winkleman can you just restate what the concern is i'm sorry to ask you to do that but i think it would be helpful Dr. Winkleman, are you still there? It looks like uh, Dr. Winkleman may have muted herself, so I'm going to request to unmute. Okay. Sorry, uh, I just said um, I find it confusing um, that a person could be both a licensee and a trainee. Uh, usually, if you have two definitions in a row, like that, a person would be under one and not the other. If I read this and I were a psychologist or a trainee, I would think that I would not be a trainee then if I were registered psychological associate. And I, I guess my overall sense is just that this addition um, of the current change to D confuses rather than clarifies things, regardless of the trend, because the um, registered psychological assistant 
technically I believe they're licensed, but actually they're registered. They're very different from a licensed, independently licensed psychologist. It's a tr temporary training category. And also, you know, there's the issue of confusion to the public. So I think there's going to be confusion for the supervisees, potentially the supervisors, but also to the public. Because if um, you're defining the psychological associate as a licensee and as supervised, but but at the same time, you're also, uh, they're, they're not at, at the same category, they're not at the same level, they're not independently licensed. I feel that it's very confusing um, to call them both a licensee and a trainee, and I simply don't see the reason for the the change here. Um, sorry, don't mean to repeat myself. <laughs> well, what if, what if we were to say, uh, uh, identify a licensee as a psychologist, and then add a piece that the a psychological associate is a trainee registered by the board pursuant to uh, BPC 23.7. Um, and so that uh, there would be just that separate section. Uh, Dr. Harpsies, I, I think that might be a great solution is to just call that out then as a separate category, explaining that they are registered with the board, uh, they're considered a, a licensee for purposes of 23.7, but they are also considered a trainee for 13887. Great. Uh, okay. So, um, and we'll see if there's any other board comments on that. So that would be identifying them as still under BPC 23.7, but the psychologists are licensees, the psychological associates are registered by the board uh, pursuant to that same section. Okay, anything else, Dr. Winkleman? No, thanks so much, Dr. Harpsheets. Sure, okay. Um, Dr. Emus, I think is, um, or Dr. Schaefer, I see. Uh, would you let you have some questions and comments? Uh, this is a moderator. Uh, Dr. Schaefer, I'm going to request to unmute your microphone. Please click the unmute me button when the prompt appears. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Hi, this is Dr. Melody Schaefer. I'm the chair of the KPIC board and also board member division to an education and training. Regarding 137, in uh, page 11, 1A and 2A, where it is stricken out, the verbiage on KPIC. Uh, my question has to do with whether that in any way changes in other uh, verbiage later on in other regulations, what we have to this point have um, had in place, which is if an intern is going to a KPIC internship, they do not have to apply for a psychological associate registration. So that's one of my questions. I have uh, three here, but perhaps if the board would be willing to speak to that first. Um, I think Ms. Chung could help us with that one. Uh, Dr. Shaver, um, thanks for the question. I want to make sure I understand. You're asking about the reference in which section, if you can mention that again. I was trying sure. to find sure. that. Page 11. Under 1387, 1A and 2A, where it is stricken out, where it says uh, internships uh, regarding APA, APIC, KPIC, those sections that are in both of these two areas. Uh huh. So instead of delineating uh, where the internships would be from, you've stricken the language, which is fine. Uh, just that my question has to do with how might that, if at all, influence uh, what we currently have in standing, which is if one goes to a CAPIC internship, one does not apply for registration for a psychological associate because under CAPIC, it's enveloped under the BOP and has been for a couple of decades or more that that's automatically recognized and accepted uh, by the BOP and there is no need to be registered beyond that. 
Uh, they, for predoctoral, if they are um, in, because uh, predoc, uh, for predoc uh, KPIC internship, they would be enrolling in a uh, qualifying um, doctoral degree program. So they could um, accrue hours that way and um, be exempted from registry, registering with the board uh, mm -hmm. as stated in statute. Okay, great. And then for the postdoc, because as you may recall, uh, with the Board of Psychology about 15 years or more, uh, they requested what, if KPIC could put together the KPIC postdoc, which we did, which took uh, some of the um, work uh, that the board would have to go through to register these individuals and such. And because we developed that, the same applies to the KPIC postdoc, where if they're in a KPIC postdoc, they do not, up till now, need to be registered with the board to uh, be a registered psychological associate, to use the current verbiage. So will that also remain intact? Oh, I see what you're saying here. Um, okay, so you were suggesting that we unstruck the association's reference in line through uh, 39 through 41 um, on page 11, so that it kind of, it keep intact that because I don't think that's the policy to require registra registration for the uh, postdoctoral, formal postdoctoral placement um, uh, trainees to be in the program that is overseen by these associations. With well, that, it's not, uh, well, it's not that, uh, thank you for asking. It's not that I'm asking for it to be stricken out if that is what the board determines is the appropriate language. Mine has to do with what impact, if any, this might have on the issue I brought up, which is to this point, if one is a KPIC postdoc, then one does not have to be registered with the board as a psychological, previously psychological assistant, now psychological associate. And will that remain the state of, of affairs, so to speak, or is something else being changed in addition to this that would negate that uh, way that we have been functioning I, because I, we have many postdocs at many sites as you Dr. know Schaefer, I, the way i read this and um whoever can correct me if i'm wrong is that it wouldn't negate that but the, it so but the board is asking for an actual copy of the placement contract so that's not necessarily mm -hmm. registering as a psychological associate it's just a copy of the contract the contract is fine, and that's understandable, and uh, just to make sure that this does not uh, affect the other part of what I said. We, we understand your need for the contract. Um, that leads to a second question I was going to ask. But okay. So if I'm hearing you correctly then, Dr. Sheets, uh -huh. then uh, the, the change in this verbiage does not change the status or the standing rather of CAPIC in terms of how we have been functioning in both of these realms. That CAPIC interns do not have to do anything different in terms of registering to be a psychological associate. I just want to make, just check in case I've missed something here. And then uh, again with the postdoc, that they are under that rubric of the CAPIC postdoc. They don't need to be, apply to be a registered uh, psychological associate. Uh, but the thing that has been added is, yes, there would be a uh, necessitation for this documentation that you need of uh, them being placed at such. Is that yes. correct, my understanding? Right. Yes, that is my understanding. And Ms. Chung, would you confirm that? Yes. So as long as the statute allow for exemption from registering with the board, you won't have to register with the board. Uh, I just want to point out that because the change in 29, um, the Business and Professions Code, uh, Section 2911, um, by the bill, SB801, so it doesn't talk about, it doesn't make specific um, reference to the associations for internship, but the only time that in that a uh, trainee uh, in these associations working on an internship would be they're not in a qualifying doctor program because mm -hmm. the um, the statute states that 
if you're in a doctor program, qualifying doctor program, you can accrue hours without registering, right? So, but I don't think that will be a case that happen when a trainee is enrolling in the um, formal pre formal internship, but not in a qualifying doctor program at the same time. So I just want to point that out. The only time mm -hmm. that they will register is if they're in the uh, internship uh, overseen by the association, but they're not in the qualifying doctor program, then they would need to register. Thank you. Uh, I wasn't aware of whether any other verbiage had been changed somewhere else in other documents that would then make this any different. So you're not stating it here. I just want to ensure that's not states, uh, stated somewhere else as we would need to make some substantive changes immediately. So thank you for that. My second question regarded the um, documentation of their placement. The way it's stated, are you asking for the applicant for licensure, for instance, to submit, um, when they go for submitting, are they submitting this uh, before they complete the postdoc, or do you want the form submitted once it's completed? Uh, so this will be consistent with our current process um, that when, when you sub, uh, submit, the, when the applicants submit their verification of experience, they should uh, supply, they should, they should provide this verification as well so that we can verify that, okay, this, this applicant is indeed in an exempt, exempted uh, status um, in accruing hours. Sure. So then uh, if they're in the process and they're putting things together and sending to you a priori uh, and as opposed to at the end of the placement, you would still accept that documentation that they're currently in the formal postdoc as opposed to we need the verification that the postdoc is completed, uh, if I'm correct in understanding you. Is that mm, correct? So, um, so the process um, is very applicant driven as i explained before um so we will review verification when an application is in place and when they're ready to apply those hours towards the licensure process the reason why i'm asking is the kpic office is already getting calls from training sites asking us to give them some kind of verification form at the beginning to uh, submit. I think people are hearing about something or maybe seeing some of this or however it's happening. And we were wondering until now what that was about. It so, sounds, oh, sorry. Sure, go no, ahead. go ahead, Dr. Well, Sheets. It, it sounds like the way this is written that whatever this, if the placement site um, develops their own contract that shows a start and end date, that that would be acceptable. Is mm -hmm. that correct, Ms. Chung? Yes, we want to verify that the that is uh, that the information provided um, is consistent to us, okay. or what is verified yeah. on the um, verification of experience and uh, their verification of a, uh, exemption status from registering with the board. That's very helpful. So our position would be to let the sites do it. Although they're asking if uh, we would put one together, it makes more sense to me. Uh, however, that's why I wanted to know if it comes from us, which doesn't sound like it would. Uh, I'm not sure that it would be appropriate for us to say when the start and end date is, as once they are placed, we're not responsible for their training directly at the site, nor their supervision, uh, the uh, supervisor on site is, uh, and, the supervisor and, of record. Uh, Ms. Sork has her hand up, so she might be able to add to that, Dr. Schaefer. Great, Ms. thank Sork, you. Ms. Sork, please. I just wanted to mention that um, historically, or since I've had my time on this board, um, when we look at language changes to our statutes or our regulations, uh, we have a very enthusiastic uh, group of applicants um, who may interpret that these changes already are, are made. Um, and, and I appreciate attention to detail and and certainly with following uh, where we are on uh, making policy changes but we want to make sure that uh, you know this is as everyone on the line today knows this is all draft um, and has not 
started the regulatory process yet, um, but historically, we used to be a clearinghouse for verification of experience forms, which was why we had made the change to say, you know, please don't send this until you have an application with us on file because there were times when we may never see an applicant again and we were holding a lot of verification of experience uh, documents and, and they may not ever apply with us or they may apply with another state. So that's why we came up with the verification of experience process, which would be after the experience had taken place. Um, I just wanted to, to make that clarification about kind of timing on sending the documentation that we really don't want to hold documents um, until we know that the person would like to apply with the board. Yes, thank you for that. And at CAPIC, we're not starting anything. We actually were wondering why people were asking this question. And now today I know why. I'm, uh, I expect something leaked out somewhere and, and they're uh, reacting. But uh, this has helped immensely. The last thing I wanted to bring up, if I could, is uh, we're already in Division Two hearing this in the CAPIC a little bit about the supervision grid and some of the FAQs and such, and that they're not up to where the changes are. And I just want to offer my assistance in that of Division Two, if uh, because I'm sensitive to the fact that the office, as was stated early on, is uh, understaffed uh, in the present case. And I'd be happy to help, as I'm sure the Division Two board would, if that was of any use to your board, and to let us know. And we'd be happy to assist and see if we could draft something from what uh, has changed for your perusal. So um, it's there for the offing, if that is in any way of assistance. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Dr. Schaefer. Okay, Dr. Emus. Madam moderator, can you send Dr. Emus a message to unmute her microphone? Um, I've already unmuted it. Great. Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. we had a little delay. Thank you so much for uh, giving us the opportunity to give input today. I'm Dr. Marilyn Imos from the California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation. And I wanted to bring us back to 1380.3, the definition of licensee, which for us as, a, as an, uh, an organization and an exempt setting even has potentially more difficult consequences uh, if we would change this definition I uh, concur heartily with Dr. Winkleman, and I think that separating uh, those two things out, a licensed psychologist and a, a psychological associate who is also licensed by the Board of Psychology, but with a different type of license, I think this distinction would be very important. I just kind of want to, I'm not gonna go into a lot of um, uh, detail in regards to our terminology and the penal code and so but um <clears throat> we use a different terminology as an exempt setting we've had this terminology for a long time so basically what the public uh, whom we also serve and then the the patients um who are a special category and inmates uh are concerned uh, a licensee is the same thing as a psychologist and this can have uh, tremendous legal consequences if somebody misunderstands this. Uh, we have our consent forms and so on. Uh, we don't have licensed psychological associates. <clears throat> we actually call our unlicensed clinical staff uh, by a different term that I'm not even going to introduce here. It's also anchored in the penal code. But um, a change in language may down the road really serve to confuse our situation. It's very important for us to be able to maintain a, a direct distinction between a licensed psychologist and uh, somebody, a trainee, uh, who is not licensed. And so um, coming from where we are, 
this language uh, issue is, I find very important for us um, and would like to see maybe as, as was suggested previously that these two um, these two terms be defined in a, in a different um, not together but but separately so you're in support of us uh, making that change I'm in support of having a change where licensee of the psychologist who is licensed is defined in one line and in another line we then define the psychological associate yes who is that's also right. licensed but that distinction needs to be made because otherwise we will really have uh, problems if we if we have if we conflate those yes thank you so much for that input and, and thank you us know how it impacts your system too so it could be it could have real legal consequences so negative consequences for us down the line so i kind of like to uh prevent uh such misunderstandings and and potential legal problems uh in that we we remain really transparent with our language so thank you very much i appreciate being able to speak today thank you okay dr linder crow would like to make a comment Yep. Uh, this is the moderator. I apologize. Um, Dr. Linda Crow had to leave oh. um, and she's no longer in the uh, okay. attendee list. Um, I do have a hand raised from Dr. Monroe. Oh, yes. Okay. And I, I see Dr. Winkleman. Oh, uh, is this from before uh, Dr. Winkleman? Um, is this an earlier comment from Dr. Winkleman? Uh, that was when she was muted. <laughs> Oh, okay, okay. Mm -hmm. And so you have now from Dr. Monroe, you have a comment from Dr. Monroe also on this topic? Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, uh, well, hello, let me reintroduce myself, if I may. I'm Dr. Monroe, PSY1501. Retired five years, holding an inactive license. Uh, I'll get into it as quickly as possible by saying uh, some of my response to my understanding of uh, board proposals to uh, status of various licenses, in particular the retirement license and at another time, if I may, I'd like to add, as because it's been discussed, I believe previously, that the inactive license that I currently hold is not that dissimilar to what I perceive as being formulated for the retirement status license. But let me continue, if I may, and say that, again, it is my understanding that with a retirement status license, as is now under consideration, there would be a one time in three to five years to reactivate that license. And I would say that this is unnecessarily restrictive. Oh, Dr. Monroe, I'm so sorry. I think this is for our next item on the agenda, correct? About the retired license category. Is that correct? I thought it was at this time, but I'd like to say something further that I've been on hold for over three hours waiting and listening and Oh, I'm so sorry. I but I do have to ask that we take that those comments under the um, appropriate agenda item and that is the next one and um, the uh, after this item, I think we will be breaking for lunch. So perhaps when you see that timing, you'll have a better idea that you don't have to stay on hold and can come back um, and that we will be addressing the retired license category right after lunch. If, if that's not correct, Dr. Tate, please let me know. Can you please understand that if I were employed, I could not take over three hours to try to speak to the board and even being in retirement, it's not the way I want to spend my time, and I would like the board to consider making it 
more possible for the public uh, or prior psychologists under practice to be able to address the board in a more timely manner. I, 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 I'm so sorry. I, do I would understand. Like I do understand that it is very frustrating to have to wait such a long time, and I apologize for that. Um, I, I feel we have to take the agenda items in order. And um, Dr. Harpsheath and Dr. Tate, may I make a suggestion here? Absolutely. Absolutely. Go ahead. May, may I suggest that we go ahead and um, I think Dr. Monroe is the last comment on this particular item. Um, and before we go into lunch recess, you can take up the item that he would like to speak on, open it for public comment. Dr. Monroe can speak and okay. then you can return mm -hmm. that back to a fuller discussion. Um, when we get back, but at least Dr. Monroe will have an opportunity to share his comments before we recess for lunch. Okay, so we will get. Okay. So, Mr. Fu, you're saying we will get through this and then Dr. Monroe can speak and then we'll go to lunch. Or, or yes, and, and I think also it's fair to say that um, since Dr. Monroe has the microphone now, we can just take his comments um, and, and know and publicly state that his comments will be taken under consideration for when the item is properly taken up. Um, that way, okay. it at least has an opportunity to speak. Okay. That sounds like a great idea. Thank, thank you, Mr. Fu. Dr. Harpsheets, is that okay with you? That's absolutely fine. I appreciate that. Thank you, Mr. Fu, for that helpful suggestion. And Dr. Monroe, please go ahead. Uh, this is a moderator. My apologies. Um, a little I hit the mute button too fast, so I'll have to request unmute. Okay, now he is unmuted. My apologies. Okay. Okay. I, th I thank you very much for giving me the consideration to speak now. Thank you again. Yeah. Um, so if I may, I'll continue. And yes. I was stating that um, from what I understand, the one time in three to five years to reactivate a license under the retirement status is unnecessarily restrictive. And as is thereafter the one time uh, one must retake the ethics exam. Um, let me try to give you some logic for my view of it this way. Um, people uh, at any point in the lifespan may choose to stop employment. That could be to uh, raise children, uh, or it could be to recover from cancer, uh, to give but two examples. And if not working, um, it does defy common sense to pay money for something we can't use. So to have fees associated with a, a license that doesn't allow us to work uh, doesn't add up, so to speak. Um, I would also say, like to add that about having to take the ethics exam if you do not reactivate within a specified period of time um, does not better protect the public, in my view. It is my experience of over two decades as a psychologist working in a private office setting, working within a medical group, working in the county jails and experience in prisons as a psychologist working and working uh, with a medical group to assist people with chronic pain, that um, you do not change, that people's ethics do not change. Uh, you either got them or you don't, to be very colloquial. And people who don't have ethics certainly know how to answer questions on an ethics exam. So, I do not believe that retaking the ethics exams uh, does anything to protect the public. I would submit and suggest that instead of the requirements of retaking the ethics exam, which delays reactivating your license and more fees, that the board require the ethics class within the 36 MSEP credits required to reactivate one's license. And I will give you a sideline to this, and that is I have moved from California to another state, and 
upon my first meeting with my physician was, and being told my profession, quickly asked me to reconsider coming into practice because of the need due to COVID and other factors. Upon my first visit with my new dentist, she asked me the same. So and these things do slow a person getting into practice when there is an acute need such as we've had with COVID. If I may, uh, with the inactive license, um, I, I don't see a reason for a two-year renewal. Um, again, it costs money. If somebody is in a crisis situation, such as battling for their life in cancer, you don't want to take time aside to protect and keep your license. It, it all, I would suggest that it be inactive until, the, as well as a retirement status license, be inactive, to use that word, until the holder wants to reactivate it. And specifically regarding the retirement status license, I would ask the board to request that there be a one-time initial fee to uh, activate that status. And again, it defies common sense to charge for something you can't use. So why would there be fees higher or any continued fees? And then also that it be allowed to be reactivated at any time, not some dichotomy of within three to five years with additional consequences if one does not do that, but that it remain in that status until death. I believe that's pretty thoroughly what I wanted to say on the topics, but I would also say that I, I see rather false dichotomy between the retirement and the inactive life status, uh, inactive license, given that change happens any point in the lifespan. And again, whether it's due to wanting to raise a family, tending to medical or one's aging parents or a host of reasons to have to cease employment by choice or otherwise that a person uh, have those options recognized by a, a license status that takes those things into consideration, whether it's earlier in the lifespan at 30, 40, or 50, or after retirement uh, portion of the lifespan. Oh, I Dr. thank the board and I would welcome any comments or thank you again for hearing me on these matters. Thank you very much for your patience, for your very thoughtful comments, and they will be taken under consideration when we address the issue in the next agenda item. But thank you again for waiting and um, offering us such thoughtful comments. Thank you for your patience with me. <laughs> okay. Okay, great. Okay. All right. Bye -bye. Um, Madam moderator, I don't see any other comments from the public on the item of pathways. Do you? Uh, that is correct. Um, would you like me to close the Q and A panel? Yes, please do. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, let's go back to uh, the board members and see if any board members have any other comments uh, on pathways before we take a vote. Um, Mr. Fu. I saw Mr. Fu's hand up um, and now I don't see it. Sorry so about that. I, I had lowered my hand and started speaking and not muted myself. Oh, um, okay. I apologize. I was gonna say, I wanted to clarify that my motion was um, inclusive of any verbal agreements to reflect the discussion that we've had. And so wanted to clarify for staff and for the um, for board members that um, given the verbal agreement you had with Dr. Winkleman and Dr. Schaefer about the language, that those will be reflected in the motion as well. Thank you. Any other board comments before we take a vote? I don't see any hands up. Uh, Ms. Proto, would you please call the roll? Uh, 
Sorry about that. It took me a minute to unmute. Okay. Uh, okay. Kasuga. Hi. Cervantes. Hi. Fu. Hi. Carb Sheets. Hi. Nystrom. Hi. Phillips. Hi. Riscate. Hi. Rogers. Hi. Tate. Hi. Thank you. Okay. Motion passes. Thank you to everyone for being very thoughtful and hanging in there with us. And I will turn it back over to Dr. Tate. Perfect. Thank you so much. We will take lunch until one o'clock. So we will resume agenda item number 20 at one o'clock. Thank you. Thank you.